So, welcome back to the second part of our discussion on Staphylococcus. And in this discussion, we'll be continuing on from where we left off in the last discussion, and that is from the pathogenesis of Staphylococcus aureus. So, obviously, without further ado, let's get on with the topic. Now, the thing about pathogenesis is, first of all, you need to understand what pathogenesis is, which is again something that we'll be studying in a lot more details in pathology. But a very brief overlay of what this thing is, pathogenesis is, is that pathogenesis is the how or what exactly happens when a particular microorganism infects our body. How does that microorganism, in this case Staphylococcus aureus, cause uh, the diseased conditions in our body? How does it lead to the clinical manifestations? All of those methods, all of those, uh, you might say, pathways and all of those things that are happening inside our body, that is all coming under a common heading, which is the pathogenesis of Staphylococcus aureus. So, as far as the pathogenesis of Staphylococcus aureus is concerned, as you can see, it is actually involving a few steps. First thing first, we need to understand how does Staphylococcus aureus actually get introduced in our body. For this, what you need to really understand is that Staphylococcus aureus already colonizes on various body surfaces. All right, examples of which are given, like the anterior nares, axilla, or the perineal skin, or even the oropharynx itself. So, Staphylococcus aureus colonies they colonize. All right, they grow in groups in these regions. All right, anterior nares, axilla, perineal skin, etc. So, obviously, that's the colonization part. Now. That's not the real deal. We need to understand how does this pathogenic bacteria get introduced inside the body. Because outside the body, there are a lot of um, microorganisms roaming about. There are a lot of common cells about which we'll talk about in a uh, later discussion, which is the uh, normal human uh, biome as far as the microorganisms or microbes are concerned. Uh, so, the normal human bacterial flora, we'll talk about that in a later discussion. But what I'm really trying to employ here is that there are a lot of bacteria around us, residing on us, but that does not mean that we are always sick, is it? That obviously means that there is something more than colonization going on. That is the next step, which is tissue introduction. How does Staphylococcus aureus get introduced to the tissues? And how does it invade the tissues? These are the next two steps. So minor abrasions or instrumentations. So you get a cut, a bruise, an open wound that gets exposed. Staphylococcus aureus can enter inside. Or instrumentations, that is external instruments uh, being inserted into the body, prosthetics, etc. These can actually be a pathway for Staphylococcus aureus to really enter inside our body and get exposed to our internal tissues. Now, how does Staphylococcus aureus proceed from there? That is the next point, which is invasion. Invasion into tissues by enzymes of Staphylococcus aureus. And that is why we have already talked about these enzymes before. For example, serine proteases, hyaluronidases, thermonucleases, lipases, these are all enzymes which are, you know, kind of breaking the tissue open, making path for the Staphylococcus aureus bacteria to get inside and invade the tissues. Okay? When all of this is happening, an interesting thing is that or rather an interesting question might arise as to how does our immune response let this happen? After all, Staphylococcus aureus is immunogenic, it is pathogenic, it is virulent, right? So how does our immune response um, not do anything about it? The answer is, it's not that our immune response doesn't do anything, it's just that Staphylococcus aureus evades our immune response. 
that is the next point which is evasion of host immune response not only does it invade the tissues it evades the host immune response and how this also we have talked in the previous discussion by employing a large number of those virulence factors for example the cell wall associated factors some factors help it in inhibiting the colonization uh, or inhibiting the opsonization some help in inhibiting uh, neutrophils some do pla platelet damage so all of these ploys that it actually kind of employs to evade or inhibit our immune response all of those things they come into play over in the pathogenesis okay finally after infecting the host a metastatic spread starts that is cephalococcus aureus it starts to spread to various distance and distant sites by obviously blood blood is a huge transporter so that is overall these points are actually pointing out as to what exactly happens and how does Staphylococcus aureus bring about the clinical manifestations that it does. Speaking of clinical manifestations, let's talk about the clinical spectrum of Staphylococcal infections. Now this mind you is a huge list and I have just kind of edited it out and uh, you know only shortened it out and only kind of shown the most important ones at least the ones that I thought were very important but mind you there are a lot of points so that only should give you an idea as to how varied the clinical manifestations of staphylococcal infections really are but the first point that we have which is mostly the most important perhaps manifestation of staphylococcus uh, infection is the skin and soft tissue infection okay so skin and soft tissue infection obviously as the name is suggesting how is staphylococcus actually infecting these tissues that is something that we already talked about in the pathogenesis section now what exactly are the clinical implications under that the first point is the skin and tissue infection under this the first thing that we need to understand is the staphylococcus aureus it is actually one of the most common causes of various skin and soft tissue infections example example folliculitis furuncle carbuncle impetigo mastitis breast abscesses and a lot of other examples as well so all of these individual points they are pathogenic conditions of the skin or soft tissues where some form of inflammation or some form of damage has occurred to the skin or soft tissue for example folliculitis is actually infection of hair follicles along with some accumulation of pus furuncle and carbuncle uh, these are actually boils kind of like boils the difference between them being that furuncle is kind of a single point boil uh, which is obviously very painful and it's kind of like a lesion obviously with pus and carbuncle is kind of uh, you know multiple multiple uh, lesions both of these are associated with hair follicular regions on the skin so obviously more discussion will be done on these in subsequent discussions um, but this is just to give you an idea as to how skin and soft tissues are infected then we have impetigo impetigo is actually something which is very i think you might have seen it actually if you search it up in google you might actually see an image and identify the condition impetigo is actually uh, mostly occurring in children and what happens is sores red sores they kind of cover the child's face and later it will burst and develop into a very characteristic um, color which is known as the honey color so what we say is it has developed into a honey colored crust this is impetigo okay so these are more or less the skin and soft tissue infections now 
musculoskeletal infections this is another very important um, implication of staphylococcal infection because musculoskeletal uh, the musculoskeletal infections staphylococcus aureus is the most common cause of the, a few musculoskeletal infections as given over here for example septic arthritis which are mostly in these sites as given the knee joint or shoulder joint or the hip joint or it might be something like osteomyelitis or pyomyositis then abscess formation all of these musculoskeletal infections are mostly caused by staphylococcus aureus infection that is how definitive the infection actually is okay okay third clinical infection is the respiratory tract infection rti so respiratory tract infection also as you can see there are a lot of clinical conditions associated with this for example ventilator associated pneumonia in adults or the septic pulmonary emboli post viral pneumonia or empyema pneumothorax these are all conditions where the respiratory tract is actually infected and these are the conditions these are the pathologic conditions which are employed or manifested as staphylococcal infections empyema by the way uh, empyema is actually when fluid starts to accumulate in the perica uh, the the sac the lung sac that is in between the lungs and the chest wall right so that is empyema and as far as ventilator associated pneumonia so obviously as i mentioned in the pathogenesis section itself that many times staphylococcus aureus its pathogenesis actually involves introduction of some external instrumentation inside the body so ventilator associated pneumonia where the lungs are associated many times that is due to staphylococcus aureus all right then we have urinary tract infections we have other um, you know toxin mediated illnesses which we have already talked about in the previous discussion you know toxic shock syndrome or those food poisoning or sssss you know uh, the staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome those are toxin mediated and that's why i have not written them over in this point but another very interesting thing about uh, uh, staphylococcal infections is bacteremia and general infections so sepsis septic shock infective endocarditis these are things that we will study in a lot more details when we'll start the clinical or organ system related microbiology which will be very soon that is where 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 we'll study all of these under blood stream infections and the heart infections but remember staphylococcus aureus and streptococcal uh, infections are major reasons for primary bacteriemia and blood stream infections so what am i trying to if you are getting confused um, i'm really sorry but the thing over here that is very important if you want to like really get a take home message from here the only thing that i would like all of you to actually understand is that staphylococcal infections are very broad that's why it's known as a clinical spectrum there is a huge range of staphylococcal infections and that is actually employed under various organ systems it can range from the skin to the musculoskeletal system to the respiratory tract to the urinary tract to general blood infections it can be anything and all of these things will study individually under organ system infections in under microbiology itself so these these are all just a general gist because we were talking about staphylococcus aureus that's why we had to kind of jot down everything and put it under a list other than this getting an overview of all of this is more than enough for now all right all right now having talked about the clinical manifestations let's talk about the last section of this entire thing which is the laboratory diagnosis microbiology is not only 
understanding the bacteria or the viruses or the microorganisms themselves but to diagnose whether an infection whether a diseased condition whether a patient who has visited us is actually suffering from a suspected microorganism infection that is very important and that is where the clinical lab diagnosis is creeping in so if we have to detect staphylococcus aureus or if we have to detect staphylococcal species how do we do that that is more or less what we are going to study in this lab diagnosis so these are the points under which we'll cover the entire thing first of all we'll study about sample collection then direct smear microscopy there is not much to talk about that culture culture is a very important thing and if you don't know about culture don't worry when we'll talk about it in general microbiology you'll understand it all I'll give a brief overview of that actually in this one as well so don't worry about that then we will talk about how can we individually identify whether it is staphylococcus aureus or not that is under the biochemical identification then subtyping staphylococcus aureus under subspecies level that is that will be rather our next point of discussion and an antimicrobial susceptibility test so the first things is sample collection sample collection so what exactly is the sample here sample means or rather what is the context of this slide you might ask sample collection means that when a patient has come to us the patient is in a serious condition and the patient actually uh, you know has kind of symptoms which might be suggesting uh, a bacterial infection a bacterial infection so what we really need to do is we have to confirm that obviously just a uh, you know primary diagnosis can never be the terminal diagnosis we have to send it to the lab what do we have to send to the lab yes a sample a patient sample now what exactly will the sample be that actually depends on what kind of infection are you dealing with if the infection is something like a suppurative lesion a pus filled lesion obviously the pus will be the specimen however if the patient has respiratory infections then sputum urinary tract infection midstream urine that is not when the urination is starting early early stream no or late stream just when the urination is ending no midstream urine if the patient has general uh, infections uh, and we are actually kind of suspecting some kind of blood association then obviously blood which is bacteremia bacteremia is nothing but the presence of bacteria in blood that is the definition of that term all right the specimen will collect is blood if it is food poisoning then obviously either we go for the fecus or the vomitus and if it is an infection by carriers then we go for a nasal swab or a perianal swab okay okay so the sample collection is actually depending on the infection our specimen will change now culture what is culture so culture if obviously in a general microbiology we'll study this in a lot more detail but essentially for really understanding whether the specimen or whether the patient's sample has a particular bacteria or not we need to grow it right we need to grow the bacteria for that what we need to do is we need to provide the bacteria with the conditions with the nutrients that it needs not only for its survival but for its growth for its multiplication that is known as culturing that is we are actually inviting the bacteria to grow so that we can study it and do specific tests on it and hence conclude that yes this is this bacteria or this is that bacteria 
I'm saying here bacteria because we have already kind of limited ourselves to bacteria only for now. We are not going into viruses and all of those other things. But it can be anything. Okay? Okay. Obviously, the parameters will change in case of other microorganisms. That is why to play it safe, I'm saying bacteria. Now, as far as culture or growing a bacteria is concerned, there are certain very defined media. All right, there are a very specific defined media, which are nothing but combinations of um, certain nutrients, the combination of certain nutrients together, and under the optimal temperature, the bacteria will grow in them. Okay, these media are what we have kind of listed down in over here. Again, this entire concept will be very detailed and um, well explained, I might say, when we'll talk about this. There is an entire topic or chapter, a discussion will be there only uh, under the lab diagnosis part of general microbiology. So for now, what we really need to understand is, for Staphylococcus aureus, we need to inoculate, that is introduce uh, it in different media and overnight we need to keep it at 37 degrees Celsius incubate. Now what are the different media and how does Staphylococcus aureus show its growth in them and how can we conclude from these different media that yes this is Staphylococcus aureus. How can we conclude? Firstly, the general common sense should be that Cephalococcus aureus must be producing something or must be showing off a different color or must be giving off some unique feature which only it can show when growing in that medium. This is the common sense thing going on. This is what you should have in your backdrop. All right. Now, let's get on with the facts themselves. Nutrient agar. It's nothing but a it's a media, okay? Again, details will be there when we talk about general microbiology. In nutrient agar, what's happening is, when you're inoculating and when you're following all the steps together, if Staphylococcus aureus is present in the sample, how will you see it? It will actually grow, its colonies will grow as circular, smooth, convex, opaque, and golden yellow colonies. So these are all the morphological features of the Staphylococcus aureus colonies. They will be golden yellow. This is the most important point. And obviously small opaque. Opaque is also a very important point, smooth and circular. Why the golden yellow colonies? Because of beta carotene. Okay. So this is the unique feature of Staphylococcus aureus as far as its growth in nutrient agar is concerned. Okay. What about its growth in blood agar? The colony morphology will be the same, but in blood agar, since you have blood, then there will be some hemolysis as well. Hemolysis is a very important concept as far as bacteria growing in blood agar is concerned. Again, will be dealt with under general microbiology, not our point of concern right now. So, what I'm trying to say here is that just like nutrient agar morphology, the uh, morphology of the Staphylococcus aureus colonies in blood agar will be same or rather similar. But the only difference will be that in this case, it will be surrounded by narrow zones of beta hemolysis. It will be surrounded by narrow zones of hemolysis, beta hemolysis. McConkie agar, in McConkie agar, small pink colonies will be produced. Why? Because of lactose fermentation. Okay. Then, uh, more or less, these are the most important media, uh, not as far as non-selective media are concerned. Now, liquid medium, again, a peptone water, which is actually peptone water. If you grow cephalococcus aureus in that, there will be uniform turbidity if the bacteria actually does grow. And, Along with these uh, different media, there are certain selective media as well. In these selective media, what will happen is that 
salt is actually added to each of this media to inhibit other bacteria growth okay so many times what happens is that the sample that we collect obviously Staphylococcus aureus will not be the only bacteria that is present there there might be a number of and why might there will perhaps always be a number of normal bacteria which are part of the normal bacterial flora of that region there are a large number of bacteria which grow in um, you know our intestines in our mouth oropharynx region which actually uh, reside over our skin any exposed region right so obviously those will be isolated as well when samples will be taken from their respective uh, locations so how do you cancel those things out and how do you selectively uh, grow or look for Staphylococcus aureus that is actually done by a very interesting characteristic of Staphylococcus aureus and that is that Staphylococcus aureus is not inhibited by salt but other bacteria are okay its growth is not actually um, inhibited by salt so we have a range or number of selective media for example mannitol salt sugar or not sugar agar mannitol salt agar salt milk agar ludlum's medium all of these have um, salt okay and what will happen is staphylococcus aureus in mannitol salt agar it will produce yellow colonies why because mannitol is there which is a carbohydrate and it will actually ferment that to produce yellow colonies okay so that's more or less the culture part of staphylococcus aureus now how do we without culturing how do we actually kind of uh, conclude by biochemical tests that yes this might be staphylococcus how do we do that so there are a number of tests that are employed the first test is catalase test this is something that i had already talked about i hadn't talked about the actual test and i won't be talking about that right now as well because again it's a general microbiology thing but the thing is uh, this enzyme catalase it's actually tested for in this test and the pertinent or uh, rather the useful information as far as our condition is concerned in this topic useful information is that the staphylococci they are actually catalase positive which differentiate them from streptococci actually to be a little bit more precise all micrococci family members they are catalase positive and that differentiates them from streptococcus family members but since the most important members are staphylococcus in this case and streptococcus on the other case so this is more or less uh, something that we use to differentiate staphylococcus from streptococcus streptococcus is catalase negative okay now uh, there is another test which is the hugh and lifson oxidative fermentative test I'll make a video on only this test along with the next test which is coagulase test. I'll make a video on only these two tests, separate videos because these are very very important tests. Okay? So Hugh and Lifson oxidative fermentative test is actually employed to show or to see whether a bacteria is oxidative or whether it is fermentative as far as its interaction with carbohydrates are concerned. Okay? So there is a actually, you know, a color change actually uh, occurs. So um, I'm not going into the details of that. But the thing is, staphylococci, they are fermentative. Staphylococci are fermentative, but micrococci, they are oxidative in nature. Okay. So staphylococci, they are fermentative in nature, but micrococci are oxidative in nature. Again, the details of these will be discussed in another video. I'll make a short video on only this test. Okay? Okay. The coagulase test. Now, I'm coming back to the coagulase test because I've made a slide on coagulase test itself. Although I have not talked about the coagulase test procedure itself. But 
again I'll make a separate video on coagulase test only because it is that important. So let's leave it for now. But remember one thing that coagulase test is the most important test as far as Staphylococcus aureus is concerned. Okay. okay. DNA test um, again this is something that I had talked about when I had said or rather when I was talking about the enzymes. I had said that DNA is something which Staphylococcus aureus has. It's a unique enzyme for Staphylococcus aureus. So on a DNA agar, obviously a clear halo will surround the Staphylococcus aureus colonies because it has DNA's enzyme and DNA digesting abilities. So a halo kind of a thing will surround the Staphylococcus aureus colonies and we can confirm it from there. Right? Along with that, there is a phosphatase test as well which will employ uh, or rather which is used for actually understanding whether the phosphatase enzyme is actually there or not. It's not that important. But what is important is the coagulase test. Again, coagulase test will be dealt with very in a very detailed manner in uh, a separate video. I'll make about only this test. But this is the most common test to identify Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, this is kind of a unique thing for Staphylococcus. Coagulase test, what it is doing is, there are actually two types of coagulase tests. One is the tube coagulase test and the other is a slide coagulase test. See, I had said when I was talking about the virulence factors, I had said that Staphylococcus aureus has this enzyme called the coagulase enzyme. Okay. And what it actually does is, it actually helps in clot formation, obviously as its name suggests. It helps in coagulation. That is why it is known as a coagulase enzyme. Whether or not you have the coagulase enzyme, that is what we are going to see in the tube coagulase test. Okay? Okay. However, in the slide coagulase test, we are not going to check whether you have coagulase enzyme or not. We are going to see whether you have clumping factor or not. Clumping factor is, although it is a kind of a coagulase enzyme, but clumping factor is actually the bound form of coagulase enzyme. Coagulase enzyme is kind of, you might say the free form, whereas clumping factor is coagulase enzyme, but in the bound form. Okay? Slide coagulase test will test whether the bacteria has clumping factor, this bound coagulase or not. And the tube coagulase test will actually employ its abilities to see whether coagulase enzyme, the free form is there or not. Okay. So what this coagulase enzyme or the free form of the coagulase enzyme, which is checked for in tube coagulase test, what it will do? It will actually bind with CRF, coagulase reacting factor in the plasma. It will bind with that and what it will actually do is it will actually activate prothrombin which will lead to the formation of fibrin from fibrinogen and we know that fibrin threads when they polymerize, when they are formed from fibrinogen, they will form a clot. Okay. This is what the uh, entire mechanism is for the free form of coagulase enzyme. So, as you can see, coagulase enzyme will require coagulase reacting factor in the plasma. Right? Right. Now, coagulase enzyme, this free form, it has eight serotypes. That's not that important to know. Okay, what is important to know is that in the tube coagulase test, what we actually do is we take a plasma sample, which is actually having one, uh, one is to six kind of a ratio, a one is to six uh, ratio of plasma and saline that is actually taken, and then it will be kind of emulsified with the bacteria which is Staphylococcus aureus in this case 
and then we will actually uh, you know overnight incubation will be done and all of those method uh, all of that will happen and then later after overnight incubation and all of that we'll see if a clot has been formed i'm obviously not remembering the details very well i'm sorry for that but again this will be dealt with under in a separate video itself a short video will be made only on the coagulus test okay what i'm trying to draw your attention towards is that how the slide coagulase test is different. First of all, slide coagulase test is checking for the clumping factor. That is the bound form of the coagulase enzyme. And clumping factor, this will not require the CRF in plasma. It will directly uh, lead to the formation of fibrin threads. Okay, it does not need to bind to any other molecule and do its stuff. And as the name suggests itself, tube coagulase is done in a tube and a clot, if it is formed, then it is positive. Slide coagulase is done on a slide and two drops are taken. Uh, the bacteria is emulsified with the saline and the plasma. And if clumps are formed, then yes, it is slide coagulase positive. Okay. Now, we were talking about Staphylococcus aureus, right? So there are some, uh, obviously there are other staphylococcal species as well. A very important thing is staphylococcus lugdudensis gives a negative result in tube coagulase test, whereas it gives a positive result in slide coagulase test. Okay, okay. Just like that, the opposite is also, uh, you know, we have some which are only to tube coagulase positive slide coagulase negative we have examples of that so these are differences between the tube coagulase and slide coagulase test staphylococcus aureus is positive for both tube coagulase and slide coagulase test okay now uh, thing is if you didn't understand coagulase test that much don't worry i'll make a separate discussion only on coagulase test and there will be another separate discussion only on um, the test that we did before that. But what was that? Uh, yeah, the Hugh and Davidson oxidative fermentative test. Only on these two topics, there will be separate discussions because these are very important. Now, the typing of Staphylococcus aureus. Typing means subclassifying Staphylococcus aureus. When we are saying Staphylococcus aureus, we have already descended to the species level because you are mentioning aureus. So aureus is the species name, right? But there is a subspecies classification as well. Obviously, there are different strains of Staphylococcus aureus. That is one classification, obviously. But a subtyping of Staphylococcus aureus into subspecies level can also be done on the basis of their susceptibility to different bacteriophages. What I mean by that is, if you remember, bacteriophage is a virus, which is a virus for bacteria. So this virus, a virus, what, what it does, it actually hijacks our cell mechanism, our cell machinery, and it will hijack that, and it will um, use its own equipment, its own DNA machinery to replicate right using our own cells machinery that's more or less how a virus works but just replace human cells with bacteria and you have got bacteriophage so bacteriophage is a virus which will hijack a bacteria and do all those nasty stuff so um, obviously cephalococcus aureus is a bacteria and obviously it will be susceptible or rather the different strains of cephalococcus aureus will be susceptible to different forms of bacteriophages Right, this is the tactic which is used for subtyping Staphylococcus aureus strains into subspecies level. So, for example, if a particular strain of Staphylococcus aureus that is lysed, that is broken down by the fudges as given in the example 29, 52A, and 79, this is the way the bacteriophages are numbered, right. So if it is actually lysed by these three bacteriophages, then we say that the Staphylococcus aureus is fudge type 29, 
52A79. Okay, so based on what actually um, what bacteriophages lice you, you are named on their basis. Now, actually, there is a long kind of a classification. It's not as simple as is given here or even given in the book itself. There is actually a very long process and there are a number of uh, bacteriophage typings and it's pretty complicated. But for now, this should suffice, I would say. Now, since bacterio uh, Staphylococcus aureus is a pathogenic bacteria, so bacteria must be dealt with. It's a pathogenic bacteria more so. So it must be dealt with. How do we deal with bacteria? How do we deal with pathogenic bacteria which have infected us? Yes, we use medicine. We use drugs. Problem is Staphylococcus aureus, since it's been around us for so long and since we have used so many drugs on it, that it has kind of developed a resistance to many of those drugs, to many of those antibiotics. Worst thing is that Staphylococcus aureus is a very, very fast mutating bacteria which can very easily uh, mutate and which can very easily adopt or acquire drug resistance against particular antibiotics. Very, very simply. Right? So that's why it's given that about 90% of Staphylococcus aureus strains are resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. Beta-lactam antibiotics, this is something that we'll deal with in, obviously, pharmacology. It's actually a group of antibiotics which have a beta-lactam ring in their structure. Okay? Penicillin and all of those things. So most of Staphylococcus aureus strains are resistant to these antibiotics. How? Why? Because of the production of beta-lactamase enzyme. This beta-lactamase enzyme is also known as the penicillinase. This enzyme will cleave the beta-lactam ring in the antibiotic and done. The antibiotic will be rendered ineffective, useless. This beta-lactamase enzyme, it is actually plasmid coded. Plasmid circular DNA, we already know. And since it is plasmid coded, the implication here is that since it is plasmid coded, it can be transferred inter bacteria by transduction. And this is the reason why uh, perhaps one bacteria had it and then a lot of bacteria started having it. Lot of Staphylococcus aureus strains had started having it. And by that, 90% of Staphylococcus aureus strains are now resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics. Okay? Okay. Now, there is another mechanism by which they are resistant to beta-lactam antibiotics and that is by alteration of the penicillin binding protein, PBP. This specific mechanism is mostly shown by a particular strain or not a particular strain, or rather let me put it this way, it is shown by strains of Staphylococcus aureus which are methicillin resistant. These strains of Staphylococcus aureus are known as methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, MRSA. What is exactly going on over here? What exactly is the penicillin binding protein? Let's find out when we talk about the MRSA. These MRSA, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, methicillin, by the way, it's also another group of antibiotics. What is happening in these bacteria is that there is a gene in them, which is the MECA. This MECA gene will actually produce an altered PBP or it will alter the PBP penicillin binding protein. This penicillin binding protein is naturally or normally it is present in the bacterial cell wall, the Staphylococcus aureus cell wall. PBP essentially this is what normally should happen. You have a normal penicillin binding protein in the Staphylococcus aureus bacterial cell wall. The bacteria has this protein and the bacteria is going on and infecting and doing all those nasty stuff that it does and what we do 
we take penicillin or any beta lactam drug we ingest it and the drug starts to show its physiologic effect and what the drug will do is it will go and bind with this penicillin binding protein and it will inhibit cell wall synthesis because PBP is essential for cell wall synthesis for the bacteria. No cell wall, you're not being able to synthesize cell wall, so automatically you will die because cell wall is incredibly important for bacterial survivability. This was the ploy which was kind of used. Problem is, now the bacteria have, thanks to the MECA gene, altered the PBP to a special PBP known as PBP2A. This is what we have named this altered penicillin binding protein. PBP2A. PBP2A is not in the contract for these beta-lactam drugs. Beta-lactam drugs were like, hey, but we were supposed to kill or bind to PBP. We don't know anything about PBP2A. And the bacteria is like, okay, fine, then you can't do anything to me. And that is essentially how methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus strains have developed a resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics. Okay. So this methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, this is actually a huge topic in itself. And uh, these MRSA, they are again community associated or hospital associated and there are differences in between them, um, which is something that you can find in your textbook, I hope. Not very, uh, I didn't find it very difficult or anything like that. It's pretty easy to follow. What is very important to follow rather is that vancomycin is the drug of choice against methicillin resistance Staphylococcus aureus strains. Vancomycin is very, very important. Problem is, there are certain strains of Cephalococcus aureus which have developed a resistance against vancomycin as well. They are known as vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or VRSA. However, there are certain Staphylococcus aureus strains which have not completely developed a resistance to vancomycin. They are kind of semi-resistant. They are known as vancomycin intermediate Staphylococcus aureus, VISA. Okay. So the thing is, in India, VRSA or vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus are not that common. VISA, intermediate Staphylococcus aureus, are on the other hand, as days pass, they are getting common. Okay. So, even when uh, we have a VRSA, vancomycin resistant Staphylococcus aureus, uh, we have a number of drugs which can actually deal with that. We have telavancin or daptomycin we have. So, all of these drugs and there are a lot of other drugs, I can't remember them right now. Um, so, these are drugs actually that can still deal with Staphylococcus aureus infections, even when it is vancomycin resistant. So, based on the resistance of Staphylococcus aureus to different of these antibiotics, the treatment of Staphylococcus aureus by different antibiotics, that is different. Okay, and there is a list for that. It's actually pretty easy to follow. If a Staphylococcus aureus strain is sensitive to penicillin, then obviously, if it is sensitive to beta-lactamase, oh, not beta-lactamase, if it is sensitive to beta-lactam drugs, obviously you go for a beta-lactam drug. So if it is sensitive to penicillin, you go for penicillin, or rather to be a little more precise, penicillin G, right? If it is methicillin sensitive and not methicillin resistant, methicillin sensitive, then you go for antistaphylococcal penicillins, such as uh, cloxacillin or nafcillin. These are two very, very important um, methicillin sensitive Staphylococcus aureus um, drug choices. And in case of methicillin resistant MRSA, you go for vancomycin. And if it is vancomycin resistant, then obviously you go for the drugs that I just mentioned like um, telavancin or daptomycin, all of those. So 
For now, I guess with not much apt pharmacological knowledge, it's a bit difficult to follow these drugs. But when we'll deal with pharmacology and when we'll study about these drugs, things will get a lot more easier, I guess. What I'm trying to actually point out here is that there is an entire, uh, you might say, flowchart. Not exactly a flowchart, but kind of a table-like thing going as to how we are going to deal with cephalococcus infections, when it is resistant to this, when it is resistant to that. And the entire ploy of this entire thing is that we have to think on our feet and adapt. Just like the bacteria itself is adapting, we also need to adapt. Finally, a little bit discussion about cons, which is coagulase negative staphylococcus. The most important of these cons, they are staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay. Now, cons as a general thing, the most important thing to say about them is that they are mostly harmless commensals. So they reside on our skin and uh, outer body parts. And mostly they are harmless commensals, although as days go by, incidence of infections from cons is also increasing. And the most important of these cons, most pathogenic among these cons, the most infecting among these cons is Staphylococcus epidermidis. Okay. And it is the most common cause of prosthetic device related infections, which I was just talking about in the Beginning of this discussion, the co most common cause of prosthetic device related infections like endocarditis due to insertion of valvular prosthetics. This is just an example. When we will study about endocarditis, we will see as to how important this thing is. How important this bacteria is, how important staphylococcal bacteria are as far as infections related to uh, any kind of external prosthetic insertion is concerned. With this, more or less, we have covered the entire Staphylococcus, um, you might say, chapter. And I really do hope that uh, more or less everything was okay with this. I know I did miss a few points. And uh, we'll make separate discussions on them, separate videos on them. And I really do hope that you found this at least a teeny tiny bit useful. Thank you very much. And I really do hope to see you in the next discussion. Thank you.